And you're listening to the new WCG Network on WCGTalkRadio.com. Click live stream tab or watch us live on your smart TV, YouTube WCG Network. I'm Dr. Charles Ross. I'm the host of Your Personal Finance. And for the next hour, we're the Worldwide Community Empowerment Group, where we speak life into the community. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at WCEG Talk Radio and at WCEG Network. And last but not least, a disclaimer that all the topics and opinions are those of mine and not of the WCEG Network. We thank you for your support. Uh, I'm excited about this show. Uh, you know, I've done radio, I've done broadcasting for 20 or 30 years, and I've never really got a chance to talk about uh, this subject. Of course, on Monday, we celebrated the national holiday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in that vein, I've always felt that um, we've done Dr. King a disservice because we talk about the beginning of his life of how he started with uh, nonviolence, okay? And then of course, the high have a dream speech, but we don't talk about where he was towards the end of his life, which was much more radical. And what I'm talking about uh, is the economic philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King. The closest I got to sharing this was back in the mid nineties when I was writing for the Atlanta Journal Constitution and I wrote a column on the economic philosophy of Martin Luther King. And I just not have heard any politician, community leader group really take up that banner and say, let me look at the things that Dr. King was talking about then and let me see if I can move that forward. The only person that had done that, to my knowledge, is uh, 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 Reverend Jesse Jackson. When uh, Dr. King was killed, uh, he went to Chicago. Well, before that, he was in Chicago, and he took part of Dr. King's uh, economic philosophy with him uh, called Operation Breadbasket. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then recently, there is a, a movement among mayors, of, of, of mostly Black mayors of major cities with another part of his philosophy called the guaranteed income. And we're gonna talk about that as, as well. Um, so here's the thing, a holiday in 1983, Dr. King is when the holiday was instituted. And Dr. King, uh, it, let me back up, in Ralph David Abernathy's book, In the World, In the World, and the, um, the Walls Came Tumbling Down, that's this book right here. Book. I don't know if you can see it. That's the book. Well, in this, what you see is tab. I got all kinds of tabs on it and stuff like that because I've been reading it. I read it 20, 30 years ago. But anyway, in that book, um, and I'm going to read because I want to make sure I get this right. He says, the focus of the latter years was no longer on race alone, but on the disparity between the rich and the poor. And there were many people who opposed racism as a matter of principle, but who didn't see or want to see the economic apple cart upset. We are now talking about money rather than desegregation. And to many, that was not as a compelling a cause. So they lost, get this, they lost a lot of their financial support. Let that sink in for a minute. Now that right there might give you some idea and, you know, I might get in trouble for saying, no, I'm not going to get in trouble for saying this, that the King Center has focused on the first part of his life, which is the I have a dream, the nonviolence and all that. And I think they're calling it a beloved community, which I'm not sure what that means. But anyway, they haven't focused on his economic inequality. And the reason is because uh, I'm sure if you look at the funders and those who donate to the King Center, they're mostly, uh, I would say probably majority, white institutions, major corporations. And so if you're an organization, if you're the King Center and you're espousing changing the economic, you know, uh, apple cart, so to speak, that's not something they're gonna wanna get with because what he was talking about was capitalism and how it exploits people. And just like back 400 years ago in slavery, you had cheap labor, okay? to build this country. And now if you're talking about, uh, I wanna change the way things are going on. There is no reason why somebody should be worth a hundred billion dollars. 
okay, or 10 million. Or, I mean, as a, in a movie Forrest Gump, you know, I remember him saying something to the effect, there's only but a, a certain amount of money that a man needs, the rest is just for show. You're gonna leave it all behind anyway, you're not taking it with you. And so just think about, I saw Bernie Sanders said something, or maybe Robert Reach, who was um, Obama's uh, 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 head of Department of Labor said something to the effect that these billionaires could probably give $2,000 a month for a year or two for people and not miss any a beat. That their collective taxes that they don't pay, and a lot of them don't pay a lot of taxes, okay? That's the other issue, but I digress. So let's talk about the economic philosophy of Dr. King. Let me put this book here so you can take a look at it. Um, the two areas that he dealt with, self-help and government help, okay? In self-help, he had three issues, black businesses, labor unions, and organizing boycotts, okay? And then the second part was the government help was political power, full employment, and the guaranteed income. So those, that was his economic philosophy. So let's kind of dissect this a little bit. And I know uh, um, later on in this show, I'm going to be bring on one of my business partners to talk about, remember last week, I talked about financial resolutions for 2021. And so now I'm gonna help you give the tools to help you get there, okay? So I gave you the strategy of what you should do now, give you the tools to help you get there. So let's go into this. So self-help, black businesses. Now, I've heard people say, I went to a black business and you know what, the, the customer service was bad, yada, 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 yada. And I wanna say, well, I am sure you've walked into a lot of white establishments where you didn't get good service, but you don't say I'm not going back in there. If you go to Mickey D's or Burger King or Longhorn or Outback or anywhere or Macy's and you don't get good service, you still go there, okay? So we need to stop that. Okay, because there's another book and I'm gonna grab this off my shelf. Where is it? Oh, here it goes. This is a book called The Jewish Phenomenon. I would love to get this author on. I may try to get him on because this book, <laughs> I laugh because in this book, okay, this a Jew, Jew, Steven Silberger, gives the seven keys of enduring wealth for people. And he gives these, I, I couldn't believe that they actually put into a book why Jewish people are successful. And one of the things they talk about is owning businesses. And here's what the Jews do. If a Jewish person goes into a Jewish establishment, okay, and they don't get good service or they contract them for something and the person doesn't deliver, they don't say, oh, I'm not gonna do, with it, do business with any Jews anymore. Okay, for one, Jews have synagogues and they may report that person if he stiffed somebody, but more importantly, they go find another Jew. But we have this mentality that if one black person owns a burger shop or owns a, a soul food restaurant and messes up, we just throw them all out. Stop that. Just stop it. Okay, so we need to take a page out of the Jewish book and say, listen, if a brother does me wrong, I'm going to go to him first. Day, we go to him and say, listen, I came to your restaurant, I came to your business, and I didn't get good service. Here's why. You go to the owner. Now, if the owner says, you know, screw you, I'm not going to do any changes to get an attitude, then fine. You go find another Black business to do business with. But don't throw us all out because you have one problem with one Black business. That's what we do. Oh, crabs and barrel. I'm not gonna let anybody get some, you know, it's crazy. Stop it. So he thought black businesses were important, that they need their support. And there's so many black businesses. I know I live here in Atlanta. Atlanta's supposed to be a, the Mecca and there are a lot of black businesses here. That's why people keep coming here because of the opportunities, you know, and we need to support our own. We need to get that out of that attitude. That doesn't mean that we don't support the other folk, okay? but we need to start supporting our own. And that's number one. So that was one of the things. Um, and then the second part of that, I think I beat that up enough. The second part of that was um, um, taking leadership roles in labor unions. You say, why labor unions? Well, remember back in the 60s that the issue was getting jobs. Uh, folks that were electricians and carpenters and so forth and tradesmen, the labor unions kept them out. And so, you know, 
they couldn't get a job because a lot of times when they when when companies are going to build a building or or something of that nature, they go to the little unions. Well, if you weren't in the union, you couldn't get a job. My cousin, who was an electrician, God rest him, he passed away a few years ago, but he was an electrician and built and worked on some of these major skyscrapers. And he used to tell me all about that. Yeah, you know, them white folks, you know, got it all locked up and he had to get in there so he could be certified so he can get jobs and be included in those things, okay? So labor unions were very important to getting jobs. That's why some of the other political parties come against unions because they don't want unions to have collective power to be able to negotiate, okay, these contracts. How much are you gonna pay an electrician, a carpenter? So you can make a decent living to take care of your family. They don't want that. They wanna get the lowest pay, all right? Okay, so labor unions were very important, and I feel they still are. And I think Biden, the new president, has has uh, done some initiatives to deal with labor unions and, and, and talk to them about that. The third thing, remember this self-help, was one, black business, supporting black businesses, labor unions, and now organizing boycotts. Now, the other thing with black businesses, one of the things that uh, Operation uh, Bread Pasket did, and I'm talking about boycotts in just a minute, is making sure that you put money in black banks. We only have here in Atlanta, to my knowledge, we only have one black bank, that's Citizens Trust Bank, to my knowledge. There, was, there were others, Capital City Trust, you had First Southern, all these banks went, went away. Now, part of that is because of, you know, just in times, but why we only have one black bank? And now I know you got Killer Mike coming up with a game called Greenwood Bank and everything, and we'll see that's gonna work out. That's really a black, version of Chime, if y'all been seeing these ads on, in, in, on TV about these branchless, branchless banks, which could work very, very well. So we'll see how that's gonna work out, okay? Um, so boycotting. Now this was a big deal, okay? Here's how it worked. There's a book, and I, I, I wanna maybe get this author on too. I've been trying to get him, where's this book? Um, it's written um, by one of the, um, persons that were involved in what they call Operation Breadbasket. And here's how it works, the name of this book, Operation Breadbasket, good book. And here's how it worked. They would go into a town, let's say they look at, uh, let's take a company, Kroger. Uh, so they'll go into and say, okay, uh, what we'll find out what percentage of their uh, customers were black. Let's say it was 20%. And then they would say, well, you got 20% of your business coming from black folk, then 20% of your employees should be black. 20% of your executives should be black. 20% of your people on your board should be black. You should spend 20% of your advertising with black companies. And I know when I had my radio show, I used to call on a company uh, in Chicago, Burrell Advertising, which is was started by an African-American. He's written a book called Brainwash. That's another good book. But anyway, they were the recipient of getting contract with major Fortune 500 companies because of that. And they were very successful in, you know, getting them to come to the table and have contract. In this book, um, he actually, in one ch at the end, he has an appendix of the contracts that they cut with these companies to get them to come to the table. They signed agreements to do certain things. Now, why was that so successful? Why were boycotts so successful? Boycotts were successful because the Montgomery bus boycott. They remembered that. They remembered that folks in Montgomery walked to work, school, shopping for a year. For a whole year, it was actually a little bit more than a year, and brought the Montgomery you know, bus uh, system to its knees. And Dr. King said, power, hear me when I say this, power is the ability to get a company like General Motors say yes when they want to say no. That's power. Not doing it because they like you, but they only understand that dollar. Now, we have been told to vote. Right? And I'm, and I'm talking about that thing in a little bit. But anyway, and we should vote. But we got to go beyond that. We could have shut down Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, all these conservative talk shows if we just boycott their advertisers. Now, the argument is that some people say, well, that's freedom of speech. Oh, yeah, you got the, I, you got the opportunity to, to talk and say whatever you want. You get on the corner over here and, and spew whatever you want. That's freedom of speech. But you know what? I don't have to pay you for it. 
if I'm a company, I don't have to pay you for it. If it's against my interest. And so we could shut down Fox News. We talk about how bad it is. No, you focus on their um, advertisers. That's how you shut them down. And we could shut them down long ago. Why haven't we done that? Why hasn't the NAACP, the Urban League, or any other entity done that? And I'm going to tell you why. It's the same thing about the money that the King Center gets, that money coming from white corporations and philanthropists. You can't start a movement. You can't criticize the folks that are giving you the money. That's the way, kind of the way it goes. So yes, we need to vote, but that's not enough. If any entity is promoting folks, things that are against our interests, we boycott them. We hear that all the time. I remember Michael Vick, you know, he did time in jail, lost millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, and they were still boycott him. They didn't forgive him. So boycotts work, okay? So we got to be real about that, you know, that boycotts do work, and we have to get up the mindset that we got to be able to say, you know, okay, enough is enough. You know, we got to be able to make sure that we're able to do the things that, you know, um, that needs to be done. So we need to understand boycotts work and I'm waiting. I'm just waiting. And I may be as, as my mom used to say, holding my hand on my ass too. I do. <laughs> that's one of her old sayings until that happens. But if we just vote and that's it, it's, it's not going to work. I'm just being truthful. I'm just looking at history that we're 50 years later, we're doing this, we're dealing with the same thing. When, when a former president tried to overturn the will of the people and tried to, I guess, change, you know, uh, insurrection, overthrow the government, really. It took all of that for Republican donate, donators to say, philanthropists to say, okay, we're not going to donate to Republican causes. It took him to try to overturn the government for them to withdraw their support. Think about that. All the stuff he said and done, they finally said, okay, I'm done. But what was that? That's a boycott. So don't tell me boycotts don't work. So self-help, black businesses, supporting black businesses, Number two, labor unions. And then number three, organizing boycotts. That's the self-help part. That's stuff that we can do. And if, if you have politicians and not espou espou espousing that kind of rhetoric, because they got their hands out. Dr. King said that he didn't trust politicians, black or white. <laughs> Think about that for a second. And what's odd, in my view, a lot of his his uh, lieutenants went into politics. Andy Young, God rest him, he wrote to forward to my book. I'm not criticizing, I'm just observing, okay? Jesse Jackson, John Lewis, uh, Hosea, you know, um, all these folks, you know, went into politics. They even criticized him when he came out for the Vietnam War. At the end of his life, Dr. King was I mean, he was not appreciated. He was persona non grata. They did not appreciate him coming against the Vietnam War for a bunch of reasons. But we know historically after the fact that that was the right thing to do because we didn't win that war. We withdrew. But anyway, oh, okay. So uh, I've got about 10, 15 more minutes and I got to bring on my other guests. So let me run through some of this other stuff. Um, I hope you can see this on Facebook Live. Let me just go quickly here and see if we have any questions, I hope it was able to get um, get posted. Um, seen here, I don't I don't think it's uh, I think it's on Facebook Live. Um, so hopefully it is, you know. But um, yeah, I see where um, if my wife is listening, <laughs> she needs to uh, share it to my page. Uh, I think people can see it, you know. If you can do that, sweetie, I appreciate it. All right, so. We got that out of the way. Okay, now let's deal with the government helps part, okay? Uh, he focused on political power. Now that's where the part where politicians came in and he felt that, you know, the right to vote, we should all be, you know, the voters' right, right to act, all these things would see. The Supreme Court cut back some of that stuff. Um, so that was important 
for him to deal with that, you know, in terms of political power. He felt that it was very important that we have the right to vote and that we exercise that right to vote at every opportunity, you know, because that's part of it. I will go a step further. One of the things that I've committed to do as part of my maturation and my understanding of what's going on um, is that I want to hold the folks that have got political power accountable. And I'm starting at the grassroots levels about my state senator and so forth, the folks that you know represent me here in Georgia, who represent my county. And then I'm going forward to those national senators, congressmen, to hold their feet to the fire. And as my barometer, I'm going to look at the uh, Biden plan, the Biden-Harris plan for Black America, OK? I suggest you all just Google Biden, go to his page, you know, when he was running and there's a uh, Black American uh, uh, plan, I can't remember what it's called, and download it, print it out. Because see, with that plan comes policy and policy is usually encouraged by laws. So just like at the beginning of his first day in office that Biden sign executive orders do, start doing certain things. So if you could do it by executive order or by a law pass that will, you know, that, that's more permanent, then we need to hold their feet to the fire on this. Well, this is what you said you were going to do when you ran. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire because this is what you said. I'm not asking you something that you hadn't said. That's why I take issue with, with, with Ice Cube and, and, and Lil Wayne and all these other folks two weeks before the election come out with this crap. Then he already had a plan. Why don't you just support that? That's a whole nother conversation. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And I pick some organizations that I'm going to, you know, you know, donate to, but also volunteer to help. That's going to be my commitment to doing that. And then sharing things like this, opportunities for people to be successful financially, to take advantage of, of capitalism and what it entails for us. Okay. So political power is very important. Full employment, Okay, he felt that we should make sure create jobs for people if there are not enough jobs. And historically, America has done that back in uh, right after the, uh, uh, the World War II. They had certain acts that came in to put full employment, working on railroad, building railroads, building uh, highways and all that kind of stuff. I forgot what the, what the name of the act was called. I think it Work Progress Act or something like that. But anyway, so get full employment. But if they couldn't get full employment, okay, if they couldn't get full employment, then the next thing was to make sure that they had some income. And to do that, they had to make sure that they were able to, uh, you know, uh, get an income. And so it's called the guaranteed income. And basically felt that people shouldn't allow, be allowed to so fall with so a certain amount of income. And uh, back then, he thought that the guaranteed income could be installed with what it cost for the Vietnam War, about $20 billion. I don't know what it would be now. But interesting, interestingly enough, that the um, uh, a group uh, called the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income have started a movement. And here in Atlanta, Mayor Bottoms is part of that group, where they're experimenting with giving certain people who have fell below a certain amount, giving them a cash amount on a monthly basis. They've already tried this in Europe to great success because people, you know, fall on hard times, you know? And so you should not be allowed to fall below a certain income for whatever reason. And, you know, back when welfare, you know, was instituted and they don't have it now, but I remember back then that in addition to food stamps, uh, you know, uh, government housing, Section 8, public housing, um, you got food and stuff like that. Remember those big silver uh, cans of, 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 of butter? <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. You had to open it up. I remember with the little oil on the top. <laughs> That's how far back I go. Uh, that you also got cash. But with Reagan and Nixon, they started, particularly with Reagan, the welfare queen, meaning that there were folks out there and some were abusing the system, and you're always going to have that. You have that now. Corporations do it too. 
How many corporates got caught with their hand in the, in the till? Just recently, the NRA uh, went bankrupt, not because someone was suing them, because they were stealing from their own members. So fraud goes all across, but we don't call them welfare gun rights folks, do we? And uh, someone put in the chat there, more uh, whites on public assistance than blacks. And that's very, very true. And how they mess us up is that they deal with percentages. You see, they'll say something like, oh, 10% of white people are on uh, public assistance, but 25% of black people. If you are a math person and you say there are 100 million white folks, 10% of that is 10 million. There's 30 million of us, 20% would be like, three, what, six, 6 million? <laughs> so they use that against us, you know, to make us deem that we're the ones on public assistance. Me and my wife, we travel around and um, we go to some of these backwater towns to get places. And you see where some of these white folks are living in trailer parks. Now, categorically, I don't have a problem with trailer parks. Actually, not mobile homes or trailer parks, as you want to call it. I'm looking to invest in some. But you see how some of these trailer parks are just terrible. I mean, I'm talking like they're run down because it's paid for or they're only paying three or four or $500 a month. That's all they can afford in some of these real small towns. I'm talking about towns where there's only 10, 20,000 people. Uh, there's only one high school, a couple of elementary schools, one middle school where the mayor and the sheriff run the town, those kind of towns. So I say that they're experimenting with that economic equality. That's, that's where Dr. King was going. And his philosophy, I think that they should take up that page. Um, There's so many books written on it um, that, and so many articles. I was glad to see in the last couple of years that more uh, articles are being written around this time, but they don't talk about that. And I think that the, the King Center, and I don't want to criticize them, I'm just saying what I see, they keep promoting this thing about nonviolence, okay, and I have a dream. But even in that I have a dream speech, see, we, we forget. Let me, let me read something that we forget. Hold on, let me make sure I can find it. Okay, here it is. He says, in part of it, he says, I still dream that one day all God's children will have food and clothing and material well-being for their bodies, culture and education for their minds, and freedom for their spirits. Capitalism continues to deprive Americans of spiritual wealth and genuine justice. See, when you got money, you see a lot of politicians go into politics to get money. White folks get money, then go into politics and get more money. Look at Kelly Loeffler. She, uh, I think she's worth a billion dollars. What she need a job in Congress for? No, she's going to find some more money. And that's what all of them do, especially the senators. Most of the senators are millionaires. I don't know about the congressmen, but mostly senators. And so what happens when politicians go into, when our black politicians go into politics to find money, guess what happens a lot of times? They get caught with their hand in the till, taking bribes. Because, you know, someone comes to you, you $5,000, you're like, man, please. That was a million dollars. <laughs> Might be a different story. But the point is that we go in for different reasons. And so uh, I submit for your consideration that, you know, we need an entity. Uh, uh, and I say an entity because it has to be more than one person. Uh, because if you just kill one person, then the movement dies. And so I'm, I'm submitting that we need an entity that will take on this economic philosophy of Dr. King and, 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 and move that forward, okay? So um, someone put in the chat stop, uh, about the um, guaranteed income. Stockton, California became the first U.S. city to experiment with the basic income in 2019 with $500 debit cards every month to 125 residents who earn less than $45,000 a year. Wow. So this is moving forward and I'm glad to see it. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to try to support those organizations. There's one uh, um, a brother, uh, Reverend William Barber out of I think South Carolina, the Poor People's Campaign, who's taping up, taking up that mantle from Dr. King, um, looking at supporting what he's doing. But this is where we've come to right now. And with the new day, 
a new administration, you know, we need to at least, you know, think about, about some of those things. So um, I submit that for your consideration. Uh, any feedback, if you have any feedback, let me give you my email address is Charles Ross at outlook.com. And uh, if you have any suggestions or, or even some ideas for show topics, I would more than welcome that. So th that ended the epistle for today. <laughs> Joining me now is uh, Juanita Kraft. Um, uh, this sister right here is a dynamic sister right here, you know, um, and I, I just want her to give you, let me see if she's unmuted herself. You unmute yourself, sweet, you, you unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay, Hi, great. <laughs> hey, hey, Juanita. Uh, give folks some of your background because I, I don't want to leave anything out so people can know how bad you are. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm, I'm a, um, a retired aerospace engineer. I'm uh, one of the very, I wouldn't say the very first, but one of the, uh, you know, the earlier participants in the uh, dual degree program with the uh, Atlanta, University, Atlanta, sorry, Atlanta University Center in Georgia Tech. Actually, we were like the first in the country to implement that program. And now, you know, they've got it at Stanford, and MIT and all of that. But I was one of the first ones. And so I have a dual degree uh, from Spelman, a degree in physics and a degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech. I spent the majority of my uh, career working for the federal government, uh, uh, aerospace engineer for the FAA. And... Um, but I've always been an entrepreneur. So uh, recently retired about, um, bless me, five years, will be five years um, this coming June. And um, so I've taken up um, financial literacy, which I think is so, so, so important because, you know, it's just things that we don't know. Uh, people uh, discuss uh, things about, about money uh, to their friends and people who they're around. But you know, Black people in general as a community don't really have people that come into our community and tell us the right things. We usually get people that come in and tell us the wrong things and steal us and rob us blind. And then we, we're we sitting there broke because we don't have the resources or the legal um, uh, ability to go after the people that have taken advantage of us and that type of thing. So I'm just, uh, I feel compelled um, to be a resource um, for, for my community specifically to start, that's just to start, uh, because I, I realized that in, even, in, um, uh, in my zip code, which is, uh, right across the street from me, I'm near Southwest DeKalb High School here in DeKalb County, it's over 90% of the, of the students over there are economically challenged. Mm. Um, and, and it's, and we're surrounded by, you know, the, the feeder schools, the, uh, elementary schools, I think are two or three elementary schools and a middle, couple of middle schools or whatever that feed into it. They are, they're title one schools. That means they have to, they get free breakfast and all that kind of stuff at school because they may not have the resources to have that at home. So, right. um, I'm, you know, the thing is, is like, once you retire, if you put in, you know, 30 years and I'm a single parent too, I raised, I have two adult children. Um, you're like, what do I do now? How do I make an impact? And how do I make a contribution to my community? And I can't think of a better way um, than to do, of course, I, I do my music. I almost forgot about that, Charles. Yeah, um, I was going to get to that. Sing, singer, songwriter. I have uh, a gospel CD that I, I produced, wrote, wrote uh, performed it produced uh, back, gosh, about 15 years ago, but I, every now and again, I'll put out something, you know, I uh, have a couple of Christmas songs and just just fun stuff. And I do it because I like doing it. And, um, you know, we, we should all find a way to be self-expressed. So that's really my goal in life, to be fully uh, self-expressed and also be a contributor. And so, you know, the thing I keep thinking about aerospace engineer and why I'm so fascinated by it when I was a little boy, I don't know if I ever told you this, when I was a little boy, you remember the, um, uh, you know, uh, the, la the moon landing back in, what was that? 63, I think it was 60, where it was 63, 64. Anyway, every little boy, everybody was watching that moon landing and mm -hmm. I wanted to be an astronaut. 
I really did. I make every little boy at that age. And I actually had little modules, little uh, models of the Luna module and the command module. And, uh, and uh, I was kidding my wife. I said, you know what? I'm going to get them again, put them on my shelf. This is a reminder of the little kid in me. But to be an aerospace engineer, that to me just signs, to me spells of intelligence and maturity to be able to even do something like that at a time where you didn't have black folks doing that, let alone black women, you know? Sure. And uh, so that, that to me is exciting. And then you go away to your, your creative side, uh, being a, a singer, you know, that to me is extraordinary. So that speaks a lot about your ability to kind of uh, be self-actualized as we call it, you know, you're, you're, you're living the best life. So you're fully retired now, but now uh, I had, um, uh, Juanita on this other show I was doing and she was sharing exactly what she's sharing now and so we became business partners because we want to help people become financially literate financially successful and if you think about it if there's not a millionaire in your family then you might have to be the first one I mean someone has to start somewhere and there's a way to do that so what I want to do let me see I can share my screen here and pull up this let me see where I can find it let me see where I can find it somewhere. Oh, there it goes. All right, there we go. Let me uh, zoom out a little bit. And this is the plan. Do you want to share a little bit of, about the overview, about what this is, the uh, program that we're part of, the financial services we offer? And we're trying to, there's, there's 10, 12 different services, and we're just going to take one briefly. We got about 20 minutes, and we'll, I guess we could spend two or three minutes on each one, and that would do it. You want to give an overview about the service and what it entails? Yes, um, we actually work for a company called United Credit Education Services, and uh, they are a nonprofit, actually, and they offer a series of services that help a person to clean up their credit, educate you on, um, you know, uh, what to look for on your credit report and so forth, and then show you how to get, get negative things off, um, and then also just budgeting and, and so many things that we're just not taught. So I want to start off first with the credit restoration. And most people don't know that there, there are so many things that you can remove from your credit re, uh, report just by disputing it. For instance, um, you, can, uh, you can remove bankruptcies, uh, collections, um, late payments, and so forth. Of course, you have to have some documentation to prove some of those things. But as far as like bankruptcies and things like that, a lot of times those things can come off just by uh, disputing it on your credit report. And uh, because of the, we use the Fair Credit uh, Reporting Act. And it, so that's a law. And so the people think that that is illegal to remove things off your credit report, but it is not. And so uh, we, we help people to boost their score. Now you might say, well, so what? I, you know, I don't need a, uh, to get a high credit score because I'm not getting ready to buy anything. Well, let me ask you this. Do you drive a car? And if you do, then I know you have car insurance, okay? Well, did you know that your credit score is gonna determine how much you pay on your car insurance? If you, yeah. if you live in a home, then your credit score is going to determine how much you pay on your home insurance and, and to tell you how significant that can be because you know I'm still working on my credit even though I'm a part of the company, I'm still working on my credit. So. Every time I get a boost in my credit score, I call my insurance company and say, "Do I uh, am I eligible for any increases in my uh, any decreases in my premium?" And so last year, um, I was able to reduce my car insurance by one hundred and twenty nine dollars a month, and wow. my home insurance by uh, I think two hundred and eight. And so, what was so awesome about it is that you know you pay your uh, your home insurance um, with your, what you call it, escrow. And so you're actually paying your insurance in advance. So what happens then is that once they lower what the premium is going to be, they roll it over like this is what it's going to be next year. Then they have to go ahead and give you a refund for what you, what you would have paid if 
the, if the premium would have stayed the same. So I got a refund last year on my home insurance of seventeen hundred dollars. The wow. week after I got the week after <laughs> I called in and asked them to see if I had if I was eligible for reduction, I got a check for seventeen hundred dollars. I get I did the same thing this year. I got a check for twenty four hundred dollars. So yeah, so and if you if you if you average that out over a monthly basis, that's close to two hundred dollars right. a month. And so if and people, the one thing people don't understand is that your credit score changes every month. It changes every and month. And so it's, I think my, my banker told me around the first 10 days of the year is, I'm sorry, 10 days of the month is when the credit bureau, where, where your creditors report to the credit bureau. So you could do something this month and then next month your score can go up 25, 50 points or whatever, depending on what you did. You might have paid off some things. You may have disputed some things to make sure your credit comes up. So those are the things that that uh, people need to understand that, that once your credit score, it doesn't stay like that forever. It does change literally every, every month. Now, the credit attorney, what what is that about? You know, what is, explain well, this a little bit. Well, there, there are some companies out there that um, we dispute uh, what's on the credit report and sometimes uh they won't remove it okay and it may cost you uh you know some significant damage to your credit uh, report and um you know something you, you you'll call them or write them a letter and they re don't respond or whatever that is and sometimes even in uh, collect, debt collectors will harass you and they'll do things that are illegal. There are laws against uh, what, how, they, how they can contact you if you tell them don't call you and reach and just uh, contact you via letter and then they keep calling you, guess what? You can reach out to our credit attorneys because see, you, a lot of people threaten, I'm gonna call my attorney, but at 250 to 200, 280 bucks an hour, they already know you are not getting ready to call your attorney. You just right. running your mouth. But with our program, you will have access to a credit attorney with for no extra charge. So um, yeah, so that's what they do, and uh, they, um, you know, that's part of our protection plan. Now here's the part I really like: this budgeting part. You know, a lot of people say they have a budget, but their budget is usually in their head. They probably, you know, yeah, and, and, yeah. They, and it could change. They, it was like, well, was I going to spend $50 a week on food or $75 a month on entertainment? You can't remember that. But with this system, you have a electronic way online to keep up with your budget. And to me, that's the foundation of any success. You've got to know what's coming in and what's going on. So that's part of the program is having a, a budget that helps you uh, manage your money to make sure that you're not overspending and that a budget is a tool. And I talked about this last week. A budget is a tool to help you achieve your financial goals. If yeah, it doesn't help yeah. you achieve your financial goals, then you're wasting your time. So that's one of the things I like about that. Now, the will trust power of attorney. Hey, now, Charles, I can speak to this. huh? You won't let me finish. Okay. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me let me say something about budgeting because this, okay. is, this is this is what I found. You know, if you write down your budget and you realize that you're spending more money than you actually make, mm -hmm. then then that means and it, it, it's going to mean you're going to be running up your charge cards. Right. That means that you will never have any money to save. Mm -hmm. You will never have any money to pay down your debt because you have exceeded your actual budget so when you write that budget down it gives you an opportunity to look at where you are and where you need to be and then identify areas in your uh financial plan or for us you know in your uh, financial structure find areas that you can uh, move uh, lower for instance maybe your cable bill maybe uh like you say the insurance uh, maybe save some money on uh, groceries if you you know just like I go to Aldi I buy everything I can at Aldi and after that uh, I you know I might go to Kroger or, or wherever they have something if they don't have what I need there but I I save I, I save about seventy five dollars a week just from moving uh, shopping at Aldi versus Kroger and so mm -hmm. that that adds up to about 
no, that's say send five a week, I'm at like 35 a week. So basically save about $150 uh, a month on groceries just by doing that. And so, you know, where, I mean, some, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I have a shoe fetish. So at least I have a, a couple of dollars extra where I can buy a pair of shoes, <laughs> something like that, if I want to, because I've saved that 150. But the, over here is the will, trust, and power of attorney. Now, I, at my age, and Charles and I, I think we're the same age, you know, a lot of us are seeing, you know, our parents pass away, aunts and uncles, uh, you know, especially time of COVID, we're seeing friends and family, you know, leave out of here. Okay. Now with the will, the will is going to tell you who gets what. Okay. Right. But the trust is going to tell you how they get it. For instance, you have a, 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 a family member that, um, you want to leave, um, uh, like a million dollars too, but you don't want to give it all to him at one time. So the will is going to say who gets it. The trust is going to say, okay, we're going to give you $50,000 up front. And then five years, we're going to give you another, you know, hundred thousand, you know, however you want to dis dis uh, do the distribution. But the other thing that the trust does is keeping you from having to go through probate. And when I say probate, that means take it to court and let an attorney and a judge decide how you get your money. And what that does too, is it exposes you. It lets everybody know every penny that you have. They on I mean, so if you have any debt collectors coming after you, if say your mother was in a nursing home and you owed them, they owed you $5,000, it's gonna stay in probate until everybody that you possibly owe uh, gets their money first. And if there's anything left, then, uh, they, then that's what your family get. And it can be tied up. When I tell you, for instance, that you have a checking account and say they, you had $10,000 in that, in that checking account. Okay. And you pass away and nobody's on there. There's no joint owner or anything like that. So it goes into, um, probate because it doesn't have a beneficiary. So anything that doesn't have a beneficiary goes into probate. So now that goes into probate. Now it's time to bury somebody and they didn't have an insurance policy. So now it's that $10,000 is, is sitting in probate. Okay. So then the judge going to get paid, the attorney going to get paid and all the, and everybody's going to go fund me to fund the funeral, but they had all this money that they could have used, but they can't get their hands on it because it's in probate. And I've seen, I've heard of, I haven't seen it, but I've heard of probates, the people's stuff being in probate for 10, 12 years. But, but most likely it'll be in probate for about six months. So that's, you just don't want that. And our program allows you to have, a, a, a create a will. One of, one, of the big, one, one of the big issues is for folks that have young kids. And, you know, a uh, real life example, when I was raising my daughters mm -hmm. and I was young, I had a $1 million policy. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I couldn't name my daughters as beneficiaries because they were minors right go, why can't a, a minor benefit from your insurance policy because right. they're not going to give you that money a million dollars in cash right. they're going to give it to you in a check well guess what we got to put right. that money yeah. in a bank account guess what a bank account is a contract a minor can't sign a contract that's why you have these child stars have their you know parents manage their money so the money right. went into a trust and my executive was my older sister. And then there were stipulations like Juanita was saying on when they would get the money. They get so much when they graduated high school to go to college. Then after college, they get so much, you know, they start their life. And then, you know, not down the line to like 30, 35 years of age. So it's important that uh, you have this set up and it doesn't cost you more than the cost of the program. Yeah, it's uh, exactly now these two, exactly. the debt payoff thing and the credit monitoring, I don't know if you could take those two. You only got about 10 minutes left, but we got to get okay, to the other yeah. side. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, credit monitoring, you know, you can, there's a lot of, there are a lot of programs out there for credit monitoring, like Credit Karma and so forth. And, and so ours is, uh, you know, pretty similar, but it's going to tell you um, what, uh, what things you might need to pay off to increase your score and give you some ideas there. But uh, a lot of times it does cost you money, but like I said, there's a lot of free programs out there. The debt payoff system, this is, this is a, a cool system because what it'll do, it'll allow you to choose whether you want to pay off the things with the highest interest rate first, or if you want to pay the things that have the lowest balance first, and it'll tell you how long it's going to take you, what you need to pay, how long it's going to, it's going to take you to pay off your debt. 
and um, you know, tell you exactly how to do it. And I do know that there are programs like this out there that will cost you 50 bucks a month. And this is part of our, um, our um, plan, our, um, our uh, UCES protection plan. Now, this is the other thing too, it's like with the budget, this is uh, with the budget, I, once I'd established my budget, then I was able to find money to put into this debt payoff program. So it's, you know, it all kind of works together. Now, uh, this is a, this, I like this financial lockbox. Tell us about that. That's because one of the things that happens is Juanita was sharing if, 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 well, when you pass away, you know, folks have to have access to all the accounts, your financial accounts. And this is a way to put all those in a safe, secure place. You give that to one, maybe two people that, when you pass away, they'll be able to access your your financial uh, information, your your, your 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 credit accounts, your checking account, savings account, investment accounts, and so forth. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah, that 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 is correct. And and the thing is, is that if you have a, a say, you have a an insurance policy. Some people have insurance policies, and they used to hide them in the walls and under the bed and all that kind of stuff. Well, in a financial lockbox, if you whatever account you have, you're going to put your uh, uh, your account number. Uh, you're going to put the your passwords and everything like that and identify a person who to, to reach out to. Um, and, but this, think about it like this. Say, you know, there was an earthquake or, a, and, and around here, you know, not so many earthquakes except in California maybe, but hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, and, you know, your house got torn down and all your paperwork got destroyed. This financial lockbox is a online safety deposit box that does not get destroyed at all your financial if you keep it updated um it will be a place where anybody that you name can go and and uh access your records i mean checking accounts whatever you want to put in information you want to put in here you can get with the financial lockbox now the identity monitoring we have a company called privacy armor and uh if, if somebody um uses your identity fraudulently uh, it's going to cover it. It's going to cover all your charge cards, uh, even uh, social media. Now, you know, before, <laughs> long time ago, we didn't even have to worry about that. But even uh, even uh, social media and 401ks and just all kinds of things that you never would even think about is uh, covered under this privacy armor. Now, Credit Builder uh, is definitely goes uh, in hand with the, uh, you know, the uh, credit correction or whatever, because this credit builder helps you to, like, if something you put out a dispute on something that you owe and you come back and say, well, that you did owe that, so how are you going to settle it or whatever, credit builder has, like, a ton of pre-written letters. All you got to do is go in there, put the name of the company and your return address and just, just kind of cater it to your need. But they have all the right words and statements that you wouldn't even know what to say. It's all there. Uh, helps you and it gives you credit tips. It's a it's an education service. It's in everything, anything you want to know about credit and how to build it is right there on Credit Builder. And uh, so yeah, so yeah, you can have access. In fact, I used um, a couple of letters from this myself just last week. Um, and uh, there's um, it's great. So let's go to the next service. Well, one of the things the credit I wanted to say about that is the great thing about Credit Builder is that it'll give you um, uh, things you can do to improve your credit. So it'll look at all your debts and it'll say, if you pay this off, this is what's going to happen to your, uh, you know, to your credit score. So it's a very surgical way you can go in and say, I'll just pay off this line of credit or I'll pay down this credit card. Uh, or whatever the case may be. So I just think that it's a great way to be able to build your credit. But go ahead. Uh, on exactly. the other go scroll, scroll down to the next one. Um, then Wait, you, did you, did you get identity monitor? Did you I hit did. That one? We talked about that. Okay. We talked about identity monitor. So then we've got, of course, savings goals. And, you know, in case if you want to buy something or, or just want to have, you know, they say that you should have about six months of um, money in, in an account for an emergency. Uh, but this can help you to, you know, to decide what it is that you want to accomplish and what you have to um, to do to, in order to have those savings goal and then track your progress. And then we have the uh, net worth um, for you, you know, put in your debt as far as what you what you owe and um, then the things that you don't owe or whatever, how much money you have. 
uh, so you, basically your assets and your liabilities. And it helps you to figure out what your net worth is. And you can't really grow your net worth until you know what it is. So um, these, these are great, these are great um, products to have. And you would have to go to a wealth manager. Honestly, if you went to a wealth manager, these are the things that you would pay that wealth manager for. He'd give you these exact same things and charge mm -hmm. you. Gosh, I can't even imagine how much a wealth manager would charge you for these services. And all of them are covered under our protection plan. And I want to add to, we've got some bonus pro pro uh, products. Let me, let me just say something about net worth real quick before we go. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. the net worth, you know, we talked about budgeting is a tool to help you achieve your financial goals. Your mm -hmm. net worth is a better indication of what kind of money manager you've been. And you should track it on a year to year basis. Maybe at the end of each year, you look at your net worth, look at it was last year, hopefully it's going up because you could make a million dollars and spend a million five easily. And we've heard of athletes and attainers and other business folks that do that. So net worth is a great way to track how well you've been able to hang on to the money that's coming through your hands. Okay, go ahead uh, with the other one. Absolutely. So we've got, we've got some bonus uh, products here that, that uh, just go along with what we have. We have the uh, RX card, which is a discount on prescriptions, and you can save up to 80% on prescriptions. And you probably say, well, I've got, you know, I've got insurance and they might pay, you know, depending upon what kind of insurance you have, um, they might pay 80 and you pay 20. Then they, you know, some like Kaiser I have, you know, I pay $10 for certain things, but then there's some things that you know they don't you don't get for ten dollars there's some things you, you have to pay a lot more for but these this prescription drug you can go online and find the best price before you even go there and uh i've seen things that would normally well there have been testimonies let's just say that of people that are, where they might have had a prescription that costs like six hundred dollars and there are some things out there that cost like that and they've been able to get it for maybe 25 percent of that price even lower than what they would be able to get with their own insurance company so this is not something you know that you should just ignore it is a great it has a lot of value then we have the uh, shop for less you want to get back an average about 5.4 percent um, you know, it does add up, you know, I, I don't even like I, if I'm on Amazon, I use I don't even use a card that doesn't give me something back, you know, I got to get something back. So I get some free stuff that makes me feel good. Well, this is going to give you back like 5.4% if you if you uh, use this app, this app to do your shopping and do the same, the same shopping that you normally do. And of course, it has about 250 um, retailers and stuff on that shop for less. Then uh, we the, we just added this today, uh, the Travel Club. Um, and they have cruises, they have flights, they have hotels, um, all types of things. You're going to see significant discounts on here. And you also get the, the travel points, so you can build points for, for your travel. So um, whenever we are able to get back uh, out there, Charles, and go somewhere, cruises or whatever, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the, this travel club is going I don't want, we only have about a minute left. I don't want you to uh -huh. forget credit my rent. Oh my God, credit my rent. Oh my, I really love this program because there's some people out here that don't have anything negative on their credit at all. No, they might not even have any a credit score. They might be credit invisible is what we call them. But still they want to, they live in an apartment and they want to give credit, get credit for the rent that they pay. Our credit my rent program is only like ten nine ninety five a month. And you can start, you can see significant increases in your score, like 50 to 100 points. Um, it can go back one year or it can go back two years, or you can just start right exactly where you are. What I think is one of the best products that we have because you don't have to go in debt. Some people say, oh, get a charge card. You don't have to get a charge card. You can just get on Credit My Rent and start right where you are spending the, the, for the price of a Netflix and start improving your score significantly with this one product. So I'm very excited about and proud of our product. And if you, uh, we got about 30 seconds left, but uh, if you're interested, I want you to take down my email address, Charles Ross, real simple, Charles Ross at outlook.com. Real simple, Charles Ross at outlook.com. Just email me and put in the uh, uh, subject or the message credit. That's it. 
you put in credit and then I'll know exactly the information to send you to be a part of that. Thank you so much, Juanita, for being such a great guest. Everybody, Thank please you, enjoy the rest of your day, whatever time you're watching this program. We'll be back here again on February 4th. All right. Bye now. Bye now.